Hello, Internet users, and welcome back to Unused Content, the amazingly named show that has once again locked itself into doing multiple videos in a row about Pokemon. During the last two videos, we talked about the unused content of the original Hoenn games, Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. And now today, to end off the journey through Generation 3, we're going to be discussing the remakes of the original Pokemon games, Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. I've been looking forward to covering this one for a while. My first video on unused content was in fact on the original games. So naturally, it's going to be interesting to see how the remakes stand in comparison. Following Ruby and Sapphire, Fire Red and Leaf Green released a little over a year afterward. And quite obviously, they were made with the same engine used for the other two games. As a result of this, there are many things left over from Ruby and Sapphire that remain on the data of Fire Red and Leaf Green, and are completely unused. For starters, all of the key items found in Hoenn exist in Fire Red and Leaf Green. But as you might expect, the majority of them don't actually do anything and serve no purpose in the Kanto games. For example, if you hack the root or claw fossil into your inventory, the scientist at the Cinnabar lab is not able to take and resurrect it into a Pokemon. Since these fossils are key items meant for another game, the scientists won't even acknowledge that you have them because you're never supposed to be able to. Also worth noting is that the mock bike and acro bike do function when hacked into use, but when this is done, the bicycle that your character rides acts just like the regular bicycle you're normally supposed to obtain in these games. Unlike Ruby and Sapphire, which has separate data for the two different bikes, Fire Red and Leaf Green only has data for its one bike, so when the mock bike and acro bike are used, the game can only call the data for the one type of bike that it has. As well, if this is the only bike you have, the guard still won't let you into Cycling Road, even if you're riding it. Also, HM8 can be hacked into use. Using it will allow the player to teach Pokemon the move Dive, just like in the Hoenn games. However, since Dive is not supposed to be an HM move in Fire Red and Leaf Green, the move can be forgotten and replaced without the need of the move deleter. One thing you may remember about the Hoenn games is that they were first in the core series to have weather effects in the overworld, featuring quite a variety of them. Every single one of these effects are still in the Kanto remakes, but are not used anywhere. This even includes the snow animation, which also isn't even used in Ruby and Sapphire. A few maps from the previous games are still present in Fire Red and Leaf Green's data. However, because these games use a completely different tile set than Ruby and Sapphire, they look completely broken and are almost unrecognizable when accessed. Interestingly enough though, there is still one map that's still intact. What I'm talking about is the Record Corner Room. The reason for it not being corrupted is likely due to the room having a unique tile set. And since the record mixing function is not in these games, there would have been no reason to alter it. And while we're on the subject of maps, there are a few other oddities worth mentioning. For some reason, there are unused copies of two maps found in Celadon City. These two are the Celadon Hotel and the Restaurant. Out of all the areas in the game, it's a little bizarre that this pair is the only case of this, and it's difficult to say what the purpose, if any, was behind making copies of them. But as if that wasn't strange enough, there is another unused map that I think will really spark some discussion, if it hasn't already. This unused house interior appears to be associated with three different routes in the game. Route 6, Route 19, and Route 23. I find this very curious as Fire Red and Leaf Green are remakes of the original two Pokemon games, and in the final releases of both the remakes and the originals, there are no buildings that would have had a place for the map showing the inside of a house. However, one potential clue to go on can be found in Yellow version. In Pokemon Yellow on Route 19, there was actually a house. This house was where the player could play a minigame with the surfing Pikachu obtained from Pokemon Stadium, or in the case of the 3DS Virtual Console version, the Pikachu that the player starts with. It's possible that Game Freak may have had plans for this minigame to return in some form, and that would explain the unused house map for this area. However, that obviously doesn't explain why the map is associated with the other two routes. It could be just as likely that this interior was meant for something completely different, and the fact that one of its locations was the same as the Pikachu minigame could all just be a coincidence. It also appears that there are many of Ruby and Sapphire's trainers left over in the data. This includes many trainer classes, every gym leader, all of Team Aqua and Magma, and even the Elite Four and Champion. It's apparently possible to battle all of these trainers via hacking, however I was unable to find a way to do so. It seems though that all of these leftover trainers don't actually have any Pokemon teams assigned to them, so I can only imagine that the game would either crash anyway or just result in an instant win for the player. Something that is pretty well known by now but still cool to talk about is how Fire Red and Leaf Green contains several unused overworld sprites for many legendary Pokemon. The fact that these were made and on the cartridges means that Game Freak originally had different plans for how these Pokemon were going to appear in the game. First off, the Johto Trio. 
In the final release of the games, one of these three Pokemon can be found roaming randomly around Kanto, in a similar fashion to how they did in Generation 2. Which one that roams is determined based on which starter the player chose at the beginning of the game. Unlike the Gen 2 games though, there is no overworld event that causes them to run off into the wild, and they will instead just be out there once the player has progressed to a certain point in the game. The fact that overworld sprites were made for the trio implies that this was not always going to be the case. Perhaps a similar scene like the one in Gen 2 was planned, which would have had the player release one or all three into the wild, but in my personal opinion, I think it's more likely that the player was originally meant to encounter one of the trio as a static legendary in a special location. Just like most of the other legendary Pokemon in the game. But no matter which way it was planned, I just wish they could have caught that stupid glitch where Reiku and Entei can use Roar and disappear from the game completely. Next up we have Mew. Despite being one of the original 151 Kanto Pokemon, Mew is actually not catchable in Fire Red and Leaf Green. In fact, out of the entire line of Pokemon games for the Game Boy Advance, Mew was only able to be caught in a special in-game event in Pokemon Emerald version. But since it had an overworld sprite made, there is a possibility that this Emerald exclusive event was also intended for the Kanto remakes, but cut for unknown reasons. As for Celebi, I'm not really sure. Maybe there was some kind of in-game event planned for it as well, but all I can really do is guess. In the end, the only means of getting a Celebi in Gen 3 was by receiving a specially distributed one from a real-life event, or by transferring from a special disc that was bundled with certain copies of Pokemon Colosseum in Japan. And finally, we come to the last two sprites, which are the attack and defense forms of the Pokemon Deoxys. While nowadays Deoxys is able to easily change between its forms using a special method that differs between games, during the Game Boy Advance era, where Deoxys was introduced, the form that Deoxys retained depended on which game it was on. Knowing this, it would make perfect sense for these sprites of the attack and defense forms to be in the data. However, in the final version of all games that feature the Birth Island event, Deoxys is always seen in its normal form, and will not change into its proper form for that game until after it is captured. This renders these two sprites completely useless. A little oddity I discovered about Deoxys though, is that if the player KOs it instead of capturing it, the Pokedex will show it as being seen in its proper form for the version it is in, rather than the normal form that was just fought. And that does it for Legendary Pokemon, but there's still a couple of interesting unused sprites to look at. For instance, there exist sprites for the player's character surfing on what appears to be a Lapras looking blob. In the final versions, a different set of sprites are used for the surfing animation instead. The story behind this extra set is not known, but the likely scenario is that it was an early version of the surfing animation that was discarded. Or perhaps this was supposed to be a unique animation that would only happen while surfing on the Pokemon Lapras. I'm just guessing here though. When searching through your TMs, a small detail you can see is that each type of move has its own color of disc. Out of all the TMs in these games though, there actually isn't any that teach Bug-type moves. As a result of this, the sprite for a Bug-type TM goes completely unused. You might think that because it's yellow, the game is actually just using an Electric-type TM sprite. However, this one is actually just a slightly different shade. Later in Gen 4, when Bug-type TMs became obtainable, the color used for them would become a light green instead of yellow. Unlike many of the other Pokemon games I've talked about on this show before, Fire Red and Leaf Green surprisingly don't have much in the way of unused music. It seems that there is only one track that is never played anywhere. It is a very short clip that sounds like the original healing theme from Pokemon Red and Blue. There is some speculation that this is a relic of a feature that would allow for the player to change the game's soundtrack into that of the original Game Boy games, similar to what we saw in the Johto remakes Heart Gold and Soul Silver. It's only a single small clip though, so it's really anyone's guess as to why it's there and what its original purpose was. An area that is exclusive to Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald is a place called Altering Cave. If you were like me as a kid, then you probably thought that this cave was pretty stupid. It's just one open room that has nothing inside of it but a 100% encounter rate for Zubats. You know, I have to admit, it's pretty surprising that these games managed to get away with an E rating when they had such a graphic depiction of hell in them. But anyways, unused data reveals that there was originally more to this place than I had previously thought. Apparently Nintendo planned to set up some things known as wonder spots in the real world. By using Mystery Gift at one of these spots, a Johto Pokemon that you see here would appear within the cave. In the end, none of these wonder spot events ever happened in any region of the world. Because the Game Boy Advance could not connect to the original Game Boy, that left many of the native Johto Pokemon from Gold and Silver without a way to make it onto the Generation 3 games. It seems obvious that this altering cave event was intended to be a way to allow for the player to complete the Pokedex. 
It's thought that the reason that they never went through with the Wonder Spot idea was because all of the Pokemon set to appear within the cave could already be obtained by connecting the Pokemon Colosseum or XD. What's interesting though is that following the Fire Red and Leaf Green, Emerald Version released with its own Altering Cave, but also contained an extra area within the Safari Zone that allowed the player to find many Johto Pokemon anyway. Seems pretty pointless if you ask me. On Seven Island, there is an area known as Trainer Tower. There is something very unusual about its map though. You see, normally when hacking your way out of bounds in most areas, you can't go very far until you hit an invisible wall. This tells you that you've reached the end of the map and the game doesn't have any data for anything beyond this point. But for whatever reason, the map of the Trainer Tower location has a massive amount of space that goes unused. It may be possible that at one point there was supposed to be more to explore in this location, but it's impossible to say exactly what that would have entailed. And while we're on the Sevi Islands, there are a few bits of info regarding unused content about them. Within the data, there are unused maps named Sevi Isle 6, Sevi Isle 7, Sevi Isle 8, Sevi Isle 9, Sevi Isle 22, Sevi Isle 23, and Sevi Isle 24. In the final games, there are only seven Sevi Isles in total, which is why they're called the Sevi Islands, I guess. However, in the list we see here, the ones named 6 and 7 are different than the ones we see in-game. They consist of only a single tile each. The maps Isles 8 and 9 actually have finished map data, but looking at them, we can see that they are almost completely barren, with very little to see. There aren't even any wild Pokémon to be found. The fact that they were finished being programmed, though, hints that they were cut during the later phases of development. If the player actually hacks their way onto these maps and checks their town map, it can be seen that these areas were intended to be placed around Four Island. It seems that despite the names of these maps implying that they were full islands, it seems more likely that they were intended to be additional routes to Four Island. Further evidence of this is that these four maps are listed in the data after areas on Three Island and before areas on Five Island. In a similar way, this is also likely the case for the three other maps. Sevi Isle 22, 23, and 24. They are also very barren, and comparing their layout with their position on the town map clearly shows that they were meant as extensions of Seven Island. It's not known why these additional areas of the Sevi Islands were cut. If all of them were scrapped late into development, the most likely scenario I can think of was due to time constraints. There is somewhat of an easter egg in Fire Red and Leaf Green that is a nod to the original games. In Red and Blue, interacting with the TV in the player's home from the side brings up the text, Oops, wrong side. In the remakes, due to how the TV sprite was made, it wasn't possible to interact with it from the sides without going out of bounds. But despite this, the same text can be found. This also works in both games when checking it from the back as well. None of the other TVs in the game have this text, and it is unique to the one in the player's home. It's unclear whether or not the necessity of going out of bounds to see it was intended by the developers, or if some kind of change during development resulted in it being moved around and simply forgotten about. And while we're disrespecting the boundaries of our good friends, the walls, we've got a few other things to take a look at. In the Celadon Hotel, a pair of stairs can be seen in the background beyond the counter. As a kid, I've always wondered about that. Unfortunately, moving past the counter reveals that the staircase actually doesn't do anything and is just for show. Similarly, there is a woman's house on Seven Island, who has a bunch of boxes blocking off a door. Walking through them, though, it is revealed that they lack a warp point and do not take us anywhere. This woman's house is just like the one I discussed on a previous episode for the Hoenn games. Originally, there was some sort of feature that involved using e-reader cards, or in the case of Fire Red and Leaf Green, Mystery Gift, that would allow the player to access certain battles beyond these barriers. However, just like the Hoenn games, this was removed during localization, and they placed sprites there to block it off. You can actually see a version of how the house here was supposed to look like hidden within the data. Once again, I just have to say how stupid this is. If you had to rearrange things, then why not just put a wall there instead? Blocking it off just makes me think that there's something special I have to do to get past it. On Three Island, there is a man who is seen digging a tunnel. By coming back later in the game, he will have finished it, and it will become a long path that leads to a small area where rare Pokémon can be found. But by moving out of bounds, we can reach this area before the tunnel is finished. The cave entrance on this side is here by default, because you're not supposed to be able to get here by any other means. By going inside, we will end up inside the tunnel while it is unfinished. Something I find a bit amusing. And to wrap up our stay on the Sevi Islands, we're going to stop on over at the daycare. Going past the fence, we can see that just like in Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, the Pokémon here don't display anything when interacted with. This also applies to the Pokémon Zoo in Fuchsia City. 
This is a little disappointing, as if you recall, during the unused content episode on Generation 1, it could be seen that these Pokemon had placeholder text that made it appear as if they were startled by us being somewhere we were not supposed to be. By the way, the grass here cannot trigger any wild encounters, as these type of tiles are not programmed to in this area. In the Hoenn games, this was not the case, as there was already grass on the same route as the daycare in that game. Something that carried over from Ruby and Sapphire was a strange property of the PCs. For whatever reason, interacting with them from the back causes this weird glitch where they spawn a huge tower of more PCs. I've also found this to work with the one in the player's home at the start of the game. And now we come to something very peculiar that I stumbled across by complete accident while messing around with the game. In Mount Moon, I noticed that while moving out of bounds, I would seem to occasionally trigger the animation for when the player jumps over ledges. Upon further inspection, I realized that the reason for this was because the developers actually used the sprites for the ledges as aesthetic pieces in this area. They clearly never bothered to remove the ledges overworld properties because we were never supposed to reach these spots. I find this to be a pretty interesting example of making the most out of your resources. As far as I can tell, the only instance of the developers using the ledges like this is in Mount Moon. If I'm wrong and you found it elsewhere, tell me down in the comments below. And almost unbelievably, while I was recording footage of this, I came across another out-of-bounds oddity in Mount Moon. If you move to the spot you see here, it can be seen that some white arrows will appear on three specific tiles if you're facing downward. These arrows normally only appear to indicate when you're about to pass through a door into a new area, so I have absolutely no idea what they're doing here. As you might have expected, moving towards them results in nothing happening. Next up, we're going to talk about our good old friend Blank again. For those of you unfamiliar with this, on a previous episode, I showed that by hacking your way out of the starting area without a Pokemon, it becomes revealed that when the player ends up in a battle, they will toss out a strange question mark thing that has a blank space for a name. There isn't much of a difference in these games, but I still want to mention a couple of things. The first thing I noticed is that instead of having the sprite of a yellow Bulbasaur in the PC screen, it now has a more appropriate question mark sprite. Thank you, Game Freak. Now the results of my cheating make much more sense. The big thing I wanted to address though is that Blank is actually shiny, and as you people pointed out to me, the Blank in Ruby and Sapphire was also shiny. So there you have it folks, unbeknownst to us all, before we even picked our starter we already had a shiny Pokemon with us. But before you get any ideas about throwing that sucker on the GTS and demanding a level 9 and under Arceus for it, just remember that as soon as you receive a Pokemon, Blank will disappear forever. Lastly, to end off this video, I decided to try and experiment with what I could do by hacking before I received my starter. As most Pokemon fans know, when you have a full party of Pokemon, receiving another will have it be transferred to the PC storage system. So I got to thinking, what would happen if I had a full party when picking my starter? After leaving Pallet Town by going out of bounds, I proceeded to get a full team before coming back to trigger Oak's cutscene at the beginning. The game seems to let me take a starter like it normally would, but when I check my party, it is nowhere to be found. Afterward, I went to the PC and found that it had indeed been transferred there, even though the game never gave the usual message of informing me of this. Even though that is what I expected, it is a bit surreal to see this happening to a starter Pokemon. And I also get to beat up my rival's first Pokemon with a full party. That's also very satisfying. Hey everybody, thanks for watching the video. I'm sure you all know the drill by now. If you enjoyed the video, you know, hit like and subscribe and all that if you want. And if while you're waiting for my next big video for this channel, you can go ahead and check out some of my other videos on both this and my Let's Play channel. Obviously, you like Pokemon if you're watching this, so I'll put some Pokemon-related ones on the screen there for you, like a Moemon Nuzlocke and Mystery Dungeon. And if you want to see the unused content Generation 3 video that I did last, you can check out Part 1 right here. Anyways, thanks for watching again. Hope y'all have a good night. And see y'all later!